Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson where we will be continue to revise our chemistry um, for the paper two in preparation for the paper two on Friday. So in this question, it says we've got a simplified diagram below shows an electrolytic cell used as an electroplating company to coat iron metals with silver. So here is your iron metal. Here is your electrolyte, electrode Y, electrolyte, electrode Y, and here's your electrolyte X, okay? Write down the con energy conversion that takes place in the cell. Okay, so the interesting thing with this is that the energy conversion is going to be from electrical to chemical and how do we know that well they tell us we've got a power supply so if we've got a power supply it means that we have got we're starting with electrical energy and we are converting to chemical energy it says what physical takes change takes place electrode y when the cell is in operation okay so what is happening is we want to coat this iron metal with silver so what's going to happen is this is the ag electrode there is going to be ag plus ions in here and then what happens is the a silver is going to be coated onto here so what is going to happen is you're going to see is that this electrode is going to be decreasing in mass because it's being converted to a from ag to ag plus plus an electron that's actually what's happening at this electrode so the physical change that take place is electrode Y is that there will be a loss in mass. You could also say that the electrode gets smaller. Um, anything along that line would be fine to say. Right, now it says what type of reaction oxidation reduction takes place at electrode Y? Well, we've already said that we're going from AG to AG plus plus an electron. So let's think about this. We've got oil rig where oxidation is the loss of electrons. This is obviously the oxidation. So oxidation. And while we add it, we've got red cat and an ox. And oxidation occurs at the anode. So in this case, this is going to be the anode and this side will be the cathode. Right. Now it says, write down the equation for the half reaction that takes place at the iron metal. So at the iron metal, the half reaction that's take place is that Ag plus is gaining electron to form Ag. This is one of those cool re reactions where what is happening in this electrode is the Ag is forming Ag plus ions and giving away an electron at this side. This side, the electron then comes along here, la, 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 la forms on here is now negative. You've got Ag plus ions in the, elect in the electrolyte. They get attracted to this negative um, iron metal, which then allows them to form silver on the iron metal. Name or, or formula of the electrolyte X. It has to be something to do with silver. So you could call it silver, I would say silver nitrate is probably the best one. Um, or formula, so it's AgNO3. It says, give a reason why the concentration of the electrolyte X must remain constant during electroplating. Okay, the reason this concentration of this electrolyte remains constant is because the rate at which the electro the silver plus ions are given off into the solution is equal to the rate at which they are being taken up. Yeah, you've got Ag is breaking up into Ag plus ions and the electron is flowing around there. Then Ag plus ions are being attracted to the negatively charged electrode to form silver on this iron metal. So the Basically, the rate at which the Ag plus is entering the electrolyte is the same as the rate at which the Ag plus is removed from the electrolyte, so therefore the concentration remains the same. Guys, they love asking this question. They absolutely love asking that question, so be careful of that. Right, let's move on. Okay, now we're talking about the industrial preparation of sulfuric acid, which is called the contact process. 
And the reason it's called a contact process, just interestingly enough, is because it comes into contact with vanadium pentoxide. That is why it's called the contact process. Okay, so it says write down the balance equation of the reaction leading to the formation of SO3 in step two. So yeah, we've got SO2 and yeah, we're ending up with SO3. So I'm gonna take a wild guess that even I'm hoping that you know this, that this, all that we're doing is burning to oxygen again or reacting it with oxygen again to form SO3. Oh, sorry, let me just fix this. But now obviously it needs to be balanced because at the moment we've got four, um, and that's the wrong rate, but don't worry about it. So what I'm gonna do is put a two here. That gives me now um, six, so, uh, six oxygens. And if I put a two here, do you agree? I now have two sulfurs, two sulfurs. I've got four plus two, six oxygens and six oxygens. There you go. Then it says in which step is the catalyst used and it's in step two and name the catalyst. Well, I've done it. It's vanadium pentoxide. I do want to point out to you that they asked you to name it and not write down the formula. So writing down V205 would got you zero marks. You need to actually write out the whole vanadium pentoxide thing in order to get these marks. Right, now it says, the rapidly increasing human population is resulting in an ever increasing demand for food. Okay, so we're obviously thinking fertilizers, right? To meet this demand, farmers apply a fertilizer to the same cultivated land each year. So this is explain why farmers have to apply fertilizer to the same land each year. Well, the reason is, and it's pretty obvious, I think, is that you are using the same land generally to grow the same crop, which means they need to replenish the nutrients used by the crops, the nutrients used. So they're basically just replacing the nutrients and, and your um, macronutrients, your micronutrients over and over again in order to make sure that there is so they have to replace it every year because of the food using it up, okay? I mean, because the plants using it up. Now they say, write down one negative impact of uh, that over fertilization can have on humans. Well, one negative impact of fertilization, of over fertilization, um, I don't know if they mean just write down the name of it or whatever. Um, well, there's several, okay, but over fertilization can cause the soil to be um, become toxic um, because there could be too much of the same type of nutrients in it. Um, another thing that can happen is eutrophication, and eutrophication is when the water over fertilization results in the fertilizer being washed off of the top layers of soil into the water, which then of course causes the water to be um, damaged. And it says, what process occurs when, oh, there we go, eutrophication. So that was that answer there. So one negative impact of over fertilization could have on humans, I would say would be that it um, would cause there to be a lack of food for the simple reason that the crops won't cope. Um, write down the formula of a fertilizer formed when sulfuric acid reacts with ammonia. Okay, so ammonia plus sulfuric acid. And I know they've got a pH, but at the moment you're supposed to write sulfur and sulfuric acid with an F, is going to give you ammonium sulfate, okay, ammonium sulfate. So ammonia is NH3, sulfuric acid H2SO4, ammonium sulfate, don't worry about where it goes, we're not asking for balanced reaction, we just need to write the equation, is going to be NH4SO4. That is ammonium sulfate, which is a reaction, right. Now it says, Mr. Fulyun, who's a farmer, finds an old 20 kilogram bag of fertilizer. The label on the bag is only partially visible. He has the contents analyzed and it's determined that the percentage of potassium is 13%. Okay, so we've got an NPK and potassium, he's realized, is 
percent okay it is a 20 kilogram bag okay now it says what does the number 26 okay on the label represent what it represents is that 26 percent of the 20 kilograms is fertilizer Okay, only 26% of the 20 kilograms is fertilizer. He also had the bag analyzed and 13% of it, 13% of it was potassium. Okay, so the ratio is always NPK, right? Um, we don't know what this is, but this is a two to five ratio. And they want to know what is this unknown component, determine the size of that unknown component. But now of this 20 kilograms, 20, only 26% of it is fertilizer, okay? So 26% of it is fertilizer, but then they said that this was 13%. In other words, half of the full 26% was the 5. Therefore, this lot here had to be equal to the other 13%, which means that this year, these two here, have to add up to 5. So therefore, the nitrogen is 3. Okay, so the unknown component of the NPK ratio is 3. Okay, let me explain it again. This 26% is telling you that 26% of the of this bag is fertilizer. So all of this together is making up 26%. He had it analyzed and the percentage of potassium, which is K, is 13%. So on the ratio of 3 to 2 to 5, 5 out of whatever makes 13%. But 13% is half of 26%, which means that half of this is five, so the other half also has to be five, therefore this is three, because three plus two equals five. So therefore the unknown component of the MPQ ratio is three. It's a nice little question. Right, so now we're starting again at the beginning doing organic chemistry, okay? So let's get started. So let's have a look at this. Now again, I've told you several times that when you start an exam paper, you get given 10 minutes reading time and I'd really like you guys to use it properly and read the questions. And while you're reading, think about what they're showing us. Yeah, we've got butanelle, which we know is an aldehyde. Obviously we can't write anything down, but we can think about it. And this is an aldehyde, okay? Which has got a double bonded O at the end. This here has got CH3, CH2, and then CCCH3. So there's, it's an alkane or an alkenal alkyne, we're not sure, but there's definitely something going on there. We can maybe add it up. Um, yeah, we've got a double bonded O, and it's not in the middle. I'm not at the end, so it's a ketone, okay? Yeah, we've got a haloalkane, because the bromines and the alkanes. Yeah, we've got one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So that is a very branched alkane. And this ethyl ethanoate is obviously an ester. Obviously an ester. Okay, so now it says a compound with the general formula CNH2 n plus 2. So that is definitely an alkane. That is an alkane. So let's have a look at this one. I just want to check if this is obviously not an alkane. This is. Let's just check it. One, two, three, four, five. That would be C5H. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. H12 works. So therefore, the correct answer for that is E. The ketone we've already identified is C. The alder I had is A. Isn't that nice? Look at this. All these marks you're just racking up already because you've just read through this properly. An unsaturated hydrocarbon has to be B. Remember, we decided this is either an alkene or an alkyne. So that is obviously B. How nice is that? Okay, now let's see what they've asked. The next bit. It says for compound F. Remember, this is an ester. They said they want the structural, the structure, the functional group to which it belongs. Okay, write down the structure 
of the functional group. So this is what we're looking for is an ester linkage, which is going to be O dash C dash double bonded O. That's the ester linkage. So that is the structure of the functional group of your ester. Now you want the IUPAC name of the acid and the alcohol. Now remember the first part of the name is the alcohol. So therefore this is going to be ethanol. And then ethanoate is obviously going to be ethanoic acid. And actually this one was quite easy because even if you thought that was the acid, you'd still get that out. Um, now it says, write down the IUPAC name of compound C. So this is a ketone and it's got, it's, it's got how many? One, two, three, four carbons in its main chain. So it's a but. And it's got a double bonded O on the second carbon. So it's either going to be two butanone or you could write it as butan to own, okay? And compound D is going to be 1, 2, dibromo butane, 1, 2, 3, 4, okay? It's 1, 2, okay, first of all, you always identify the main chain, which is obviously this. You then choose from the side that's closest to the nearest branch or functional groups. In this case, it's one, two, three, four. You need to tell them about the fact that they're two bromines and you need to tell them where they are. So it's one, two, dibromo, and then it's a butane. Now it says write down the condensed structure formula for C. The condensed structural formula for C. So it's going to be CH3, CH2, COCH3. Okay, so remember the condensed structural formula is effectively this. Okay, it's basically writing it out instead of drawing it. Now it says during a practical investigation, the boiling point of five. Five organic compounds, one, two, three, four, five organic compounds with known molar masses. Yeah, the molar masses 44, 58, 72, 72, 72. Okay, it's interesting. Were determined and results were recorded in a table. The five organic compounds are represented in letters A to E. And obviously, these people aren't very good at making tables because the little threes are supposed to be over here and not over there. So let's have a look at this. Do you agree that that is obviously a methane, I mean an alkane? That's an alkane, CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. This is an alkane, CH3, CH2, 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 CH3. This is an alkane with a branch, and this is an alkane with a branch. Okay, so these, how many carbons on this? It's one, two, three, four, five. This one, one, two, three, four, five. This one, one, two, three, four, five. So these have all got five carbons in them. So, and that would be true because they've all got the same molar mass. But yeah, do you see their boiling points are different? Now it says, consider only compounds A, B, and C. So we only look in at compounds A, B, and C now. So only we're looking at compounds A, B, and C. So that's quite nice because then these are obviously straight chained alkanes. Okay. CH3, CH2, CH3, so it's propane. CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, so that's butane. Then it's um, CH3, CH2, 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 CH3, that is going to be pentane. Right, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, I'm right. Now it says, consider them and write down the independent variable. The independent variable is the thing that we are changing. So the independent variable, I would say, is obviously not the group. Okay, they're all alkanes. So the independent variable would be the length of the chain. I would say the length of the chain. The dependent variable would be the boiling point. Okay, because we're measuring that. So that's what's changing. That's what we're measuring. The investigative question I would say would be how would the chain length 
affect the boiling point of the molecule. How does the chain length affect the boiling point of the molecule? Now, to just to put this in perspective, in order to make sure that you're actually doing the right thing when it comes to doing the questions and answers and the, the investigative question, there need to be two variables that are related to each other. Okay, so in other words, you need to be relating in this case the independent variable to the dependent variable or vice versa, but the point is that you are relating them. Okay, that's the first thing. The next thing that you need to know is that you need to have a question mark at the end of it. You need to be asking a question. If you're not asking a question, you're doing something wrong, okay, because it's not, it's an investment get a question. The number of people I see who just make a statement when it's supposed to be a question is frustrating. So question, it has to be a question and you need to be relating two variables to each other and they have to be the independent variable and the dependent variable. Right now it says what is the trend in boiling point from compound C to compound E? Write down only increases decreases. Fully explain the trend. Okay, so it's obviously decreasing. Okay, it's obviously decreasing. And what can we say about that? We can say the reason it's decreasing is because the more branches, they've all got the same molecular mass because they've all got the same number of carbons and hydrogens. Okay, but what is important is that they are branched. Okay, D and E are branched, whereas this is a straight chain. And the more branches the molecule has, the lower the boiling point. And you can think of this as the shorter the straight chain, the shorter the main chain, the weaker the intermolecular forces, and therefore the lower the boiling point. Now it says write down the name of the molecular series to which compound E belongs, um, as we've already discussed. It is an alkane. Now it says write down the IUPAC name of this compound. Okay, so let's have a look at it. It's carbon with three hydrogens, then a carbon with two carbons on it, one, two, and then one more carbon over here. So do you agree that the main chain is three long? So it's definitely a propane. And it's got a methyl group here and a methyl group here. So it's two, two, dimethyl propane, 2,2-dimethyl propane. There you go. Right, now let's look at this. Okay, now officially, officially, secondary alcohols aren't actually, actually no, they are, that's fine. I was thinking of something else. But, um, no, sorry, they are, it's fine. I was thinking of something else. So let's have a look at it. It says the flow diagram below shows alcohol, alcohols can react to form other organic compounds. I was going to say secondary alcohols aren't in your curriculum, but they are. So we have to study them. So let's make sure we know it. Okay. Um, so let's go through it. Secondary alcohol, reaction A gives you a compound CH3CHL, CH3. So that has got a chlorine in it. Okay. Then you've got reaction B, which is basically, let me have a look at this. Reaction B has got concentrated potassium hydroxide and you end up with an alkene. Um, then you've got reaction C, which gives you the secondary alcohol. Actually, no, the secondary alcohol goes from reaction C to the alkene. Okay, so right, so now let's have a look at this. It says write down the type of reaction represented by reaction A. So this is going from a secondary alcohol, so it's going to be having a hydroxyl N to one which doesn't have an hydroxyl N but now has a Cl. So I would say that is a substitution reaction. Okay, then we've got concentrated potassium hydroxide um, and then we have an alkene so I would say that it is an elimination because we've gone from single bonds to double bonds so we've eliminated something and if you want to be specific it's dehydro 
halogenation. Um, reaction C, they have an acid, and reaction D, we've gone from an alkene to an alkane, and we've ended up with a hydrogen. And I would say that that is either you can think of it as D, actually, what would that be? It would be cracking, wouldn't it? This would be cracking. Okay, cracking. In reaction B, B, a compound X is converted to an alkene. Okay, compound X is converted. Write down the IUPAC name of compound X. Okay, so it's C, C, C. So it's definitely three C's. And then it's an H and a CL. So I would say that the IUPAC name would be 2 chloropropane. If you're not sure about that, we can draw it out. Let's see, we've got C with three hydrogens, then a carbon with a hydrogen and a chlorine, and then a carbon with three hydrogens. And you need, yes, you do need to say that it's two chloropropane because the chloro could be on the first carbon as well. Then it says balanced equation, write down the balanced equation of reaction B using structural formula. Okay, I wish I'd known that beforehand, so I could have written it somewhere neat. Okay, so let's just do erase. Okay, so what you need to know is that the concentrated potassium hydroxide is doesn't actually participate in the reaction. The concentrated potassium hydroxide is a catalyst. Um, and you're ending up with two products um, that are coming out. The one is going to be your alkene and the other one is going to be... One second, let me just find something. Okay, yeah, say for example, you've got your, comp so we want a structural formula. So it's going to be C1, 2, 3, C, H, C, L, C, H, H, H. And what it becomes is C, H, H double bonded C H H plus H C L and you use the concentrated potassium hydroxide as a catalyst to in order to get this reaction going and breaking things up. Okay, so that is the basically the reaction that happens there. Then it says reaction C takes place in the presence of a strong acid. Okay, it has to. Um, because it's removing the water. So let's explain the term secondary alcohol. Okay, secondary alcohol is one where the hydroxyl is not on the end. In other words, the hydroxyl is attached to a carbon that's attached to at least two other carbons. Okay, so in other words, this would be C dash C dash C dash O dash H. This hydroxyl for secondary alcohol, the hydroxyl's in the middle, whereas a primary alcohol, the hydroxyl's on the end. Okay, then it says write down the IUPAC name of the alcohol used. Well, you can see that it's going to be propanol, but it needs to be on the second carbon because this is the, sorry. C dash H dash H dash H. I forgot that we're doing propene. Okay, right. So then um, this would be because alkene was going to be propene, then this bit here was going to be pro two propanol. So therefore, the IUPAC name for this is two propanol. Right, let's move on. Okay. In an investigation in the into the rate of the reaction, excess magnesium powder, that means we've got lots of it, is added to dilute hydrochloric acid at room temperature. The following spontaneous reaction takes place. The magnesium plus hydrochloric acid gives you magnesium chloride plus hydrogen gas, okay? Delta H is smaller than naught, which means it's exo 
exothermic, exothermic. It says define the term spontaneous reaction. A spontaneous reaction is one in which there is no external stimulus required for the reaction to occur. Write down the limiting reagent for the above reaction. The limiting reagent has to be the hydrochloric acid, okay? The reason is they tell you that you've got excess magnesium powder. That means that you've got more magnesium powder than you'll ever need, which means that the hydrochloric acid has to be the limiting reagent. Now it says, how will each of the following changes affect the rate of the reaction between magnesium and hydrochloric acid? Um, according to the above reaction, choose any increase, decrease, remain the same. Okay, now remember that we've got magnesium solid plus two hydrochloric acid, which is aqueous, and it forms magnesium chloride, which is aqueous, and the hydrogen, which is a gas. Okay, the same of magnesium the same mass of magnesium ribbon is used instead of powder. That is going to decrease the reaction rate. Why? Because it's going to decrease the um, it's going to decrease the surface area and therefore decrease the reaction rate. A more concentrated solution of hydrochloric acid is used is going to increase the reaction rate. Then it says the diluted hydrochloric acid solution is heated before being added to the magnesium. And that's interesting because that's actually going to increase the reaction rate. Now it says use collision theory to explain your answer in question 5.3.3. Okay, what you need to say, first of all, is that an increase in temperature is proportional to an increase in the average kinetic energy. Okay. Then what you need to say is that even though this reaction is exothermic, by increasing the temperature, you're increasing the average kinetic energy of the particles of the reactants, which results in, wait for it, you need to say this, a greater chance of more effective collisions per unit time. If you do not write this when they ask you to explain something with respect to the collision theory, you can just take those three marks and bin them. You need to write that increasing the temperature increases the average kinetic energy of the particles. Great, that's one mark. Which will then increase the chance, too, of more effective collisions per unit time. Seriously, this is so important, I've said it before, that with my own students in class, I say to them that, and I'm not really going to do this, but this is my threat, that if I had to phone them at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning and they're stumbling in on a Saturday night, Sunday morning from having partied the whole night, and I say to them, why does increase in temperature, increase average kinetic energy and increase the rate of reaction if they do not say to me more effective collisions per unit time, even in that stupor of being partying the whole night, then they would fail. Okay, that's how important this phrase is. You guys really need to say it. And no, you can't do P dot U dot T. You have to write per unit time. Okay, let's move on. During the industrial preparation of ammonia, nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas react in a closed container until the following equilibrium is established at a constant temperature of 470 degrees Celsius. Kc is 0,1 at this temperature of 472 degrees Celsius. So Kc is 0,1. The volume of the container is 0,5 decimeters cubed. I really did not mean to write all over that. 0.5 decimeters cubed. So you've got N2 plus 3H2 goes to 10H3. And they tell you the delta H is negative, which means it's exo. The equilibrium concentrations of the ammonia is 2.7 times by 10 um, times by 10 to the negative 3. H2, the concentration, is 1.221 times by 10 to the negative 1. So let's write down the term for the underlined phrase. So the underlined phrase is the industrial preparation of ammonia, which is called the harbor process. Guys, you need to know this. There's Ostwald, harbor, harbor, and the contact process. Harbor makes ammonia. Ostwald makes nitric acid, and the contact process makes sulfuric acid. You need to know them. 
Okay, so now it says write down the name or formula of the catalyst used in this reaction and the answer is nickel. After equilibrium is established, the temperature remains constant. Explain this observation. Well, because even though the equilibrium has been established, first of all, it's a dynamic equilibrium, which means reactions continue to happen. Okay, so that means that energy is the the the, the energy is still being given off at a constant rate, which means the temperature will remain constant. Now it says calculate the initial mass of nitrogen gas. Okay, so we need a table. Look, 10 marks. We need a table. Into plus where we? 3H2 is in dynamic equilibrium with 2NH3. Okay, this is actually quite a nice question. I'm going to use Shrek. It doesn't matter what you guys use, which Shrek stands for start reaction equilibrium concentration okay and then I'm gonna put a double line here and I'm gonna divide this by 0, 0,5 because they tell you that this is 0, 0,5 and this is 0, 0,5 and this is 0, 0,5 but they also told us the concentration at equilibrium was this equal to commas oh, sorry 2 comma 7 times 10 to the negative 3. This they told us equaled 1 comma 2, 2, 1 times by 10 to the negative 1. And we're trying to find out what this is. And it says um, calculate the initial mass of x. I'm going to call that x. Okay. No, this is going to be the number of moles is x. Okay, we'll work out the mass afterwards. And we know the case C. What else do we know? That's it. Okay, um, hydrogen gas reacted, okay. It says nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas, so we know we started with zero, yeah. Okay, that's all we know. That's it, that's all we got. Okay, so now let us work out stuff. So first of all, we can use this lot to work out the number of moles at equilibrium. So in order to do that, we're gonna take the 2.7 times by 10 to negative three and multiply by 0 0.5, and then we should get the equilibrium. So let's do this. So we're going to go 2.7 exponent negative 3 multiplied by 0 0.5. And that is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.135. Okay, I'm going to write it out like um, let's write it like this, 1, 2, 3. So it's going to be 1.4 times by 10 to the negative 3. So this is 1, 4 times by 10 to the negative 3. That's the number of moles we made, right? Because concentration number of moles of a volume. Okay, similarly, we're going to do exactly the same thing with this one. We're going to go 1.221. Mm -mm exponent negative 1 multiplied by 0 0.5 equals um, 0 0.06 and we can just write that as 0 0.06 0 comma 0 0.6 okay now we started with zero ammonia okay do you agree it says nitrogen and hydrogen react in a closed container so there was no ammonia so therefore the amount that we made was 1 comma 4 times by 10 to the negative 3 okay do you understand that because in order to get at this is this is at the end this is our equilibrium at the end we were 1.4 times 10 to the negative 3 in order to get that we must have made that right which means if you look at the ratio it's 2 to 1 we have used up half of that. We have used up half of that. So now we can take the 1.4, 1.4, 1 .4, 1 .4, um, exponent negative 3, and we can divide it by 2 equals, and we get 1, 2, 3, 4. We're going to get 7 times by 10 to the negative 4. Okay, so we started with x and we've used up 7 times by 10 to the negative 4. So therefore, this is going to be x minus 7 times by 10 to the negative 4. Therefore, this is going to be x 
minus 7 times by 10 to the negative 4. We don't care about the rest. All we care about is this, because now we're going to use Kc being equal to 0 0.1 to work out this, okay? So we've got Kc equals the concentration of the products, which is NH3 squared, all over the concentration of the reactants, which is N2 multiplied by the concentration of the hydrogen all to the power of 3. And that is equal to 0, 0,1. So now we're going to substitute these values in. NH3 they gave us, it was 2,7 times by 10 to negative 3. So in fact, you didn't even have to work this one out. You only had to work out this one. Or you could have worked out this one. No, we had to work out this one because we don't know what this is. Okay, so yeah. 2.7 times by 10 to negative 3 squared all over. N2 is going to be x minus 7 times by 10 to the negative 4 all over 0, 5. And this one is going to be 1, 2, 2, 1 times by 10 to the negative 1 cubed. Okay, now that equals 0, 1. So what we can do... We can just erase some stuff here. Equals 0, 1. So and that's over 1, right? So what we can do is cross multiply. So we can say, well, in that case, we've got x minus 0. Mm. Seven times by ten to the negative four over 0, 5 and that will be on the left hand side now and on the right hand side at the bottom would be our 0, 1. Okay, we're just cross multiplying and guys I've just realized that I've run out of time. So we are going to finish the sum tomorrow and then carry on. Have a great night. Cheers.